Back-to-back -back diagnoses led this patient to make some serious life changes. On today's All Things Heart, we show you the workouts that she developed on her own, focused on the heart, that are so successful other doctors prescribe them to their other patients. From the University of Kansas Health System. I am amazed. The team here is great. I came on a Tuesday and then by Saturday I had a heart in me. I have never seen a group of people work together so good as this team of heart specialists. I mean, it's just unreal. Stand by to set up show. And the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Three. Broadcast Studio. Roll. Always makes you feel like you're the most important patient on the planet. I felt heard and that was really big. This is All Things Heart. Good morning, I'm Alexis Del Cid. Welcome back to All Things Heart. Jan Powell is not the first person to be told she needed to lose weight and exercise more. However, her approach to follow those doctor's orders was intense. Janine Kiesling shows us how that one-two punch of diagnoses motivated Jan to take matters into her own hands. I'll do my oldies playlist. Jan Powell's new normal since her double diagnosis includes a high intensity interval training workout every morning. Three minutes of stretching first. At 72 years old, this is now a daily routine Jan looks forward to, but it was more of a necessity than a choice. I went into my general practitioner. She was taking my blood pressure and it was going all over the place. So she sent me to Dr. Sheldon who diagnosed the AFib. Jan had an ablation and was put on heart medication. Crisis averted, she thought. Then came the diabetes diagnosis. I thought, this is just gonna be how it's gonna be. You know, I'm just gonna slide into old, older age, <laughs> you know, with some, problems, health problems. But Jan's doctors at the University of Kansas Health System refused to give up on Jan that easily. They pushed her to go to a dietitian. That was all Jan needed to try again to watch her diet and start exercising. I started doing some YouTube exercise videos, which I liked because they were to music and it was oldies because it was for seniors. But after a while, I thought, this is, it took, you know, like 35, 40 minutes. Jan knew she was going down the same path and feared she would eventually quit working out because it was simply too much for her. That's when she looked at high intensity interval training. I looked online and saw a lot of high intensity interval training exercising routines that were pretty scary. <laughs> they were much more vigorous than I could handle. I thought, well, I'll just do my own. And that's exactly what she did. Jan shed 40 pounds and her heart is healthier than it's been in decades. Her routine is so manageable, in fact, Jan wrote a book to help other seniors get and stay in shape. Next exercise is called the triceps dip. Jan showed such tremendous progress that her doctors at the University of Kansas Health System started giving Jan's book to their other patients who need some motivation to get moving. <laughs> it's gratifying. It's kind of a compliment that they thought it was good enough for other people to do. You can't watch that and not smile. That is so great. We are so thrilled to welcome Jan Powell to our studio today alongside her incredible cardiologist, Dr. Seth Sheldon. Thank you both for being here. Jan, that is such an inspiration. Can you explain what high intensity interval training looks like compared to say running a mile? Uh, it starts out with just basically stretching and then there's uh, like 30 seconds of intense activity, and then there's like 90 seconds of rest. So quick bursts. Yes, yes, rather than continuous 
activity. And how long does the workout take About you? About 16 and a half minutes. <laughs> That's a lot shorter than yes. the, the 45 that going to the, the gym. That was the major factor that got me looking at it, yes. How long did it take you from going from looking at those videos online to then saying, all right, I'm going to create my own workout plan? Well, uh, when I was looking at them, I noticed that a lot of them were too too challenging and a lot of them were not challenging enough. So I thought, well, I'll just take the concept, mm -hmm. the high intensity concept and just use my own exercises. And 16 minutes a day, 17, 16, you lost 40 pounds. Well, from my peak, uh -huh. it's 75 now. Wow. So, Over the course of how long? Um, two years. Okay. Something like that. And that's what also what doctors recommend is not a real quick weight loss, rather do it gradually with lifestyle changes. Dr. Sheldon, have you ever had a patient take such control of their own health like this? It's really cool to see a patient take the limited time that we have uh, opportunity to counsel them in the midst of a busy clinic visit and take ownership of that issue and really implement sustainable life changes that are able to facilitate this type of weight loss and just improvement in overall health. So it's really remarkable. I think it's a special situation and example for other patients for sure. I know yeah. that you, you love Jan because we had Dr. Sheldon on another program and afterwards you texted me and like, you have to meet my patient. She's incredible. She wrote her own workout book that, that you now prescribe to other patients? I do. I have a smart phrase, actually. So we have smart phrases to try to put things in our notes really quickly. And uh -huh. I just have my little smart phrase for her book. What is it? To recommend it. Uh, just SHS HIT, H-I-I-T. Uh -huh. And so it's just education for my patients so that they know um, that there's another you know, resource out there to help people implement something that's sustainable and it's not just going to be a New Year's resolution you do for a month. It can be part of your life going forward and can make you healthy over the long term. That must feel good, Jan. My little project for the uh, self-publishing course that I took uh, bore fruit. Yes. <laughs> so did you, do, you learn how to self-publish after you wrote the book or was that something that you were was, already doing? This was that my was, practice book. That for was that the, the course. impetus for that. Yes. So I want to talk about your diagnosis because first you were diagnosed with AFib. Did you know what AFib was? I had heard of it. Um, you know, knew, to, knew it was <clears throat> fluttering in the heart and but thought it's it doesn't hurt. I don't really feel it. Uh, you know, what's the big deal? And then I learned, okay, that can send a blood clot to your brain, which could cause a stroke. So yeah, a little more serious than I thought. <laughs> so how do you explain AFib to patients? So atrial fibrillation is a chaotic rhythm in the top chambers of the heart, and it has a number of different ramifications. When the blood sits in the heart and the top chamber is not contracting the way it's supposed to, blood can sit there, and if it sits there, it tends to form a clot. If it forms a clot, it can go off to the brain and cause a stroke. So that's one of the things that we want to avoid with this. And then symptom management is another important thing. How do you initially treat AFib? Is, it, is there any step between ablation and the AFib diagnosis? Oftentimes there's a lot of different steps. Uh -huh. So there's kind of like three pillars to the management. One is lifestyle modifications. It's like the fuel to the fire with atrial fibrillation. And so we want to make sure we get control of the drivers for atrial fibrillation and any reversible factors. And then stroke risk and managing that stroke risk as well as symptom control. And that can be medications or procedures like an ablation procedure. When it comes to the actual ablation, what happens during that procedure? Yeah, so it's kind of like you have a NASCAR pit crew or something come and like hook everything up and get all our technology put together. And the summary of it is we go through the blood vessels in the leg, go inside the heart and use uh, some sort of ablation technology. There's various different kinds. There's kind of burning catheters, freezing catheters, laser catheters, and kind of an electricity catheter too. Mm -hmm. Uh, that can selectively kill or alter the tissue around the veins in the left side of the heart to try to fence off the areas that trigger atrial fibrillation, turn off the ignition switch basically. And we have some pictures that are before and after of Jan's heart, so I would love for you to talk us through these yes, before and so after this is, images. This is a view on the top of, the, of a left atrium, so the top left chamber of the heart, which tends to be the area where atrial fibrillation originates. 
and the colors represent the health of the tissue. So the purple tissue represents normal healthy tissue. There's not a lot of scar there. Red is areas of decreased electrical signal within the heart. And you can see the four veins that come into the inside of the heart there. And on the bottom we have afterwards, you can see that we've created lines basically around those blood vessels so that we fence off the signals within them but preserve the other areas of the heart. Okay, and then you shared some other images with us from a CT scan. So as we look at that CT scan, um, when we pull that up, what does this tell you? this CT scan? Yeah, so this is a really helpful thing that we do before ablation procedures is it functions as a roadmap basically for the anatomy going into a procedure. And so it lets us know not everyone's born with the same construction of the left atrium. So sometimes people have four veins like we see here. Sometimes we see, you know, just one middle vein on the left and then three veins on the right. So it helps us know what to expect when we get in the procedure. It also has prognostic information and tells us how big the left atrium is, how much remodeling is present, and what's our likelihood of success long term. Was Jan's case complicated or was it your typical AFib and then ablation? I think her situation is a good example for early diagnosis and how management early in the disease process can really change things. Unfortunately, oftentimes we see people very late in the disease process and at that point the likelihood of success for you know medications or ablation procedure decreases with time. So if we can get control of it early, it's helpful. And so fortunately for Jan's situation, I think her ablation was seven years ago or so. so I think 2017. 2017. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's been a number of years and kind of shows if you catch people early in the disease process and early ablation really changes the long term uh, you know, progression of the disease. And if you yeah. couple that with lifestyle changes, the success rate is great. And the lifestyle changes came really kicked into full swing, full gear after your diabetes diagnosis, which was mm -hmm. after the AFib. Um, it was that, if I'm hearing you, what really sparked your workout? to go into overdrive, your your diabetes diagnosis? Uh, pretty much, because I I knew more about diabetes and I knew that weight was, was a major issue and um, that I needed to do something about it. <laughs> and so as you're talking to Dr. Sheldon and you say, all right, I'm gonna start working out, we've all heard the jokes, and a lot of us have made it at our own expense about making these New Year's resolutions that fall flat by February 1st or <laughs> January 2nd. Somehow, Jan, you were able to keep your workouts going. What do you attribute that mostly to? Just uh, knowing how it was going to go or guessing how it would go if I didn't do anything. And it would just be a continual downhill slide. And so I thought I've got to do something to change this around. And you reversed your diabetes. Yes. And then the, the AFib is totally gone? Yeah, so it's something, is it gone right forever? now we're in surveillance basically, okay. just regular monitoring to make sure it doesn't come back. It is a chronic disease, so it does require long-term follow-up, but so far she's just doing great. So great that you're recommending her book to yes. patients. When you see patients that come in and they're reluctant to start exercising or they're intimidated, what is the number one reason you feel like they give you for feeling intimidated or feeling reluctant to get started? It's a great question. I think just as anyone knows that tries to exercise, just getting yourself to the point of starting to exercise is the hardest part. And so you have to make it approachable and practical for the patient. So finding something in their past maybe that they enjoyed in terms of athletic activity can be really helpful. And then set expectations and kind of a low bar. Basically mm -hmm. just getting started for the day is great. If you do two or three minutes, that's a great start. And then just kind of build on that week to week and have some progression and goals. And, and that usually helps people have a higher likelihood of achieving it. Do you think there's too much emphasis put on how long you have to exercise for because Jan's doing 17 minutes a day and it's worked wonders on her with this high intensity. 
Yeah, so there's a difference in exercising kind of steady state where you don't change the degree you're working. Um, it's just kind of stable at a platform, like you get to an exercise level and stay there for the whole time, versus doing these high intensity intervals where you work harder for a little bit and come down. And it's been shown to be more efficient in terms of building aerobic capacity and long-term health doing these uh, intervals basically where you're working harder and then you have some recovery time and it actually makes the time go by faster in mm -hmm. my, my opinion and just helps it be more fun. Do you do high intensity? I do in Interval? terms of other things so in like in biking and running yeah. and things like that. You mix it up? Yes. One of the people, Jan, that you've talked about a lot is your general practitioner, Dr. Rita Hyde. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hyde, we know you love her. She couldn't be here today because she's traveling right now but we have a surprise for you. She has a special message for you. <laughs> Hi, Jan. It's great to see you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person with you, but as you know, I'm traveling. Um, you have done a remarkable job always of taking good care of yourself. But in January of 22, um, you had a diagnosis and you needed to take charge um, and you needed to um, face the, the, uh, the diagnosis of diabetes. And you and I met and we talked about medications and you said, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to do this on my own. And I frankly didn't think you'd be able to do it. But you went in three months time from florid diabetes to non-diabetic with diet and exercise. And to your credit, it's absolutely amazing. I've never seen it in my career. You and I have been together since at least 1998, maybe longer than that. And I'm proud of the hard work you've done and you continue to do. And so proud of you for writing a book for others because it's not easy at your age to make a radical change in your lifestyle and you did it. And you're an inspiration to other patients and, and I'm proud, proud to be your uh, healthcare partner. Congratulations. That is so cool. I just love her to pieces. And she is not allowed to retire while I am living. <laughs> and neither is this one. No pressure. <laughs> to have a doctor say they've never seen this in their career, same for you? Yeah, it's pretty special. What's that like, Jan? I, I didn't know I was superhuman. <laughs> you really are. You know, and, and, and for anyone to make a drastic lifestyle change, that's hard. It's uncomfortable. It's annoying to be told you have to change how you eat or do different things. It's, it's almost like a personal affront sometimes when you first get that, that diagnosis and you embraced it. It's great. <laughs> I know. You don't, have to, you don't have to toot your own horn. We're going to toot it for you. We also have a lot of viewer questions that are coming in and we love when our viewers send us questions. So be sure to contact us right now on Facebook, the X platform, YouTube, <clears throat> or the All Things Heart email and I get those questions sent directly to my phone so you can contact us in real time. So let's get straight to it. Ruth Ellen has a question for Dr. Sheldon. When physicians listen to our heart with a stethoscope, can they pick up on symptoms of AFib? Yes, so uh, you know we can hear when you listen with a stethoscope, you can hear an irregularly irregular rhythm. So there isn't the usual pattern that happens. Uh, and sometimes this can be just due to extra heartbeats. Did you say irregular, irregular? Irregularly irregular. What's <laughs> the difference between that and just irregular? So it doesn't have any pattern to it. So irregular might be beat and then extra beat. Like lub dub dub. Yes. Lub, dub, and dub. instead okay. of that, it's just chaotic and random throughout. So it's irregularly oh. irregular. Yes. And, and that's the So end. regular would be like an extra heartbeat that happens every once in a while or a skip that happens every once in a while, which can be a precursor to these other abnormal rhythms like atrial fibrillation. Um, but if it's kind of chaotic throughout, that can be a, a tip off to atrial fibrillation. Julie wants to know, uh, Jan was able to reduce her diabetes. Can you re re reverse her diabetes? Can you reverse AFib with exercise? You can improve the control of the atrial fibrillation, yes. And that's what Jan has done? Yes. Um, Jennifer wants to know, Jan, this is a question for you, what's the biggest thing you learned from seeing a dietitian? To um, just really be aware of what I'm consuming. I mean, I, I did a, uh, she had me do a food diary and mm -hmm. just writing down everything and uh, I took it to the next level. I'm an Excel nerd, but did a spreadsheet and nice. all this. and not necessary for everybody, but it really uh, showed me the difference between what I was doing and what a healthy 
regimen would be. So what were you doing that you realized from the spreadsheet that wasn't healthy? Oh, lots of junk carbs and processed and was it foods. Like and nibbling throughout the day that surprised you once you had to write it down? Just the more the types of foods I was okay. eating. Just just not t terribly healthy. Right. <laughs> Cuz the healthy stuff takes sometimes takes more time to get and buy and prepare. Yeah. Anne wants to know, oh no, Tom, Tom's got a great question. <laughs> Tom says he's feeling inspired, wants to know where he can get your book. Let's Amazon. hold up the book so that people can see this. <laughs> so where can you get that book? Amazon. Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it's Quick Hit for Seniors, H-I-I-T, if you're mm -hmm. going to Google that, Jan, mm -hmm. Powell, uh, Jan Powell. Anne wants to know what the feedback has been and if you heard from strangers who've tried it. I, I haven't heard from strangers, uh, one person, um, said she tried it and she couldn't quite do the ones that involved uh, arm strength and I told her well you can switch modify. out those exercises modify or it might be showing you that's what you need the most <laughs> to strengthen your arms that's true <laughs> yeah it could be either or and the beauty yeah. of your exercises you modified your own so mm -hmm. people can modify theirs Georgianne has a comment she writes this is an inspiring program for exercise diet and lifestyle dietary changes congratulations to Jan for her success and inspiring others that's from Georgianne very cool. Lauren has a question about ablation. I'm going to ask you this and then I want to ask Jan. What's the typical recovery from ablation, Dr. Sheldon? Everyone's different in how they handle a procedure and handle, handle general anesthesia and everything. So um, the typical expectation is uh, there are some places that do same day discharge. We typically keep people overnight, discharge people the next morning. You have to lay flat for several hours after the procedure, which can be one hard thing after the procedure. And then for the week afterwards, take um, basically don't do extra things. So Got it. try not to lift more than 10 pounds and no vigorous activity for a week. And after a week, you can get back into regular activities. And usually people uh, feel tired and stuff for a couple days and might have some mild chest discomfort for a couple days after the procedure. But that usually subsides by the end of the first week. Jan, is that how it was for you? I, I was the same day release, you know, the, Procedure was over, got dressed, went home. Gave your salute. Didn't, didn't you feel out. a thing except for gratitude for yeah. what this guy did. <laughs> is there a chance the AFib can come back? It can. Like mm -hmm. I said, it is a chronic disease, so it does okay. require surveillance. But uh, if we catch it earlier in the disease process, we can really have a huge impact on the likelihood and timeline for it potentially to come back. Especially with someone who is radically changed, has radically changed their lifestyle and exercising and so healthy. What's your favorite exercise? Do you have a favorite part of your workout where you're like, yeah, this is my the favorite The last part. one. <laughs> <laughs> like the last, the last yes. two minutes of the yes. workout? Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's honest. Very honest. Uh, I, I just love it. I love that you took matters into your own hands. And when we hear our doctors talk about their patients being their partners, you've used that phrase. Dr. Hyde used that phrase, it's pretty special. I wanna get some final thoughts, and Jan, I would love to know, what's your message to someone who's just starting out where you were years ago and being told that you need to change your lifestyle and your diet, and they're feeling overwhelmed? It's never too late to change, to, to start. Um, and it doesn't have to be with big, things you can start slow and easy and build up uh, but uh, it's just it's not never too late are you working on more books you mentioned that that's your first uh not currently my writing has gone to helping my cats with their blog helping your cats with their blog yeah your cats have a blog yes i need we need to know the cattypusschronicles.com <laughs> the, the, the cattypusschronicles.com yes. mm -hmm. i'm going to check that out it has nothing to do with workouts but i love falling down rabbit holes so i'm going <laughs> to really enjoy that dr sheldon what would be your final message to our viewers as you sit next to your model patient yeah, I just say thank you for sharing your story, number one. It's just, uh, I love this type of stuff. I, I think exercise and healthy lifestyle goes a long ways, and uh, this is just a great testament to that and a great tool that can be utilized by other patients, so it's a fun message. 
but we love sharing the incredible work that our doctors do and that our patients do. And something else that we also love doing is showing our viewers just a little bit of what life looks like for our doctors outside the hospital walls. Now for a secret look into the guardians of healthcare at the University of Kansas Health System, let's go behind the mask. You ready to do this, Dr. Sheldon? We're going behind the mask with you and your family. Tell us who we're looking at in these pictures. So my wife, Kelly Kate, and then I've got three girls. So I have Florence, Claire, and Olivia, uh, 10, six, and four years old. What's it like being the only guy at home? It's a little different. It's taken a little getting hair? used to. Um, I'm getting used to them making fun of my hair and the gray that's coming in and everything. <laughs> but I, I can do hair, but it usually doesn't as, look as good as when mom does it. What's the best part about being a girl dad? Oh, just enjoying the time with them. It's just so fun and uh, they're so cute. And it's just fun relating with each of the different three because they each have their own personality. Do any of your daughters plan on going into medicine, following in their dad's footsteps? I really don't know at this point. They've all they had it. stages where they've gone through being a doctor or nurse uh, and playing that, but we'll see what time will show with them. Does every kid like playing with a stethoscope? And be, Dad, bring your stethoscope. They do love doing do that. they blow and into it and pop your ears? When... got her birthday money yeah. and she picked out a stethoscope <gasps> at the kid's store. <laughs> really? <laughs> just happened. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. You very it's well... a real stethoscope, just so <laughs> everybody knows. Do they? Okay, so yes. does she wear it around the house? Sometimes, check yeah. Check your heartbeat? Yeah. <laughs> Just wait, just check your heartbeat when they start dating. <laughs> You're gonna get a lot more gray hair. You got I don't like 10 think more about years. That right now. <laughs> You'll be seeing the cardiologist. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Jan, thank you. You are such an inspiration. Um, this is such a special program, and you've both been very generous with your time. So we appreciate it. And I'm going to check out your book on Amazon because I want to get a copy for my mom and me. I'm going to try it too. Coming up next week on All Things Heart, a young mother to triplet toddlers knew so much was at stake. How doctors discovered a potentially deadly condition and how those doctors saved her life. That's next Thursday at 8 a.m. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. Countless creams, gels, and drugs promise to reverse the effects of menopause. Now doctors have a laser in their toolbox. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. The five-minute treatment promising less dryness and pain. We meet one woman who says the Mona Lisa touch gave her her life back when other treatments failed. Friday at 8.